Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Post Reads Podcast Network. Yesterday's poem was by William Wordsworth, and today's poem is by his contemporary, Samuel Teller Coleridge, who lived from 1772 to 1834. Like Wordsworth, he was an English poet, uh, but he was also a literary critic, philosopher, and theologian who was a founding member of the Romantic movement in England and a member of the Lake Poets. The poem that I'm going to read today is called Frost at Midnight. And it's pretty long, so I'm only going to read it once, but I wanted to read some comments quickly from a book uh, called A Little Book on Form by the poet Robert Haas. And he's talking about the ode, and he writes this. Odes got written throughout the 17th century and were revived big time in the latter part of the 18th. There are books on this history and some very good poems. There's a critical touchstone for these poems, an essay titled Style and Structure in the Greater Romantic Lyric, published by M. H. Abrams a half century ago. Abrams describes a typical movement in the poems of the period, that they often begin by setting a scene, from our point of view the initiatory stirring of desire or disturbance. Abrams observes that the poems then move inward, taking speaker and reader on a reflective journey, a varied but integral process, he writes, of memory, thought, anticipation, and feeling. End quote. And that the poems tend to end where they began with some sense that, on arrival, the place where they began has been altered. Later critics would find a pattern of conflict, dealing with the conflict, resolving the conflict way too pat. But some notion of disturbance, a turn inward to explore its source or meaning, and a reorientation toward it corresponds in interesting ways to the movement of 17th century poems. It also connects what Holderlin described as, quote, interlichite, the vast interior sea of human inwardness, to navigate what he understood to be the task of poets. End quote. Again, that's from a little book on form by Robert Haas. And then he says, here is an instance of this inward journey. One of the great ones, I think. Coleridge's Frost at Midnight. And here's that poem. The frost performs its secret ministry, unhelped by any wind. The owlet's cry came loud, and hark again, loud as before. The inmates of my cottage, all at rest, have left me to that solitude which suits abstruser musings, save that at my side my cradled infant slumbers peacefully. Tis calm indeed, so calm that it disturbs and vexes meditation with its strange and extreme silentness. Sea, hill, and wood, this populous village. Sea, and hill, and wood, with all the numberless goings-on of life, inaudible as dreams, the thin blue flame lies in my low-burnt fire and quivers not. Only that film which fluttered on the grate still flutters there, the sole unquiet thing. Methinks its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form, whose puny flaps and freaks the idling spirit by its own moods interprets everywhere echo or mirror seeking of itself and makes a toy of thought. But oh, how oft, how oft at school with most believing mind, presageful have I gazed upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger. And as oft with unclosed lids, already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower, whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening all the hot fair day so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure, falling on mine ear most like articulate sounds of things to come. So gazed I, till the soothing things I dreamt lulled me to sleep, and sleep prolonged my dreams. And so I brooded all the following morn, Awed by the stern preceptor's face, mine eye fixed with mock study on my swimming book. Save if the door half opened and I snatched a hasty glance, and still my heart leapt up, for still I hoped to see the stranger's face, townsman or aunt or sister more beloved, my playmate, when we both were clothed alike. Dear babe that sleepest cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee. And think that thou shalt learn far other lore, and in far other scenes. For I was reared in the great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw naught lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shalt wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain, and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. 
so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity does teach himself and all, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mold thy spirit, and by giving make it ask. Therefore all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, while the nigh thatch smokes in the sun thaw. Whether the eave drops fall, heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. This is, like I said, in a pretty long poem, so I'm not going to read it again. You can, of course, go back and listen to it again if you'd like. But um, if you do, take note of that idea of the, the inward journey. It's a, it's a haunting, um, meditative poem that I really enjoy and hope you enjoy as well. This has been The Daily Poem. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another poem for you.